Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our one hour session on community health needs assessments for hospitals. I'm Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President for Government, Regulatory Affairs and Community Health at the University of Maryland Medical System. And I will moderate this panel of three today. We're so pleased to have you join us. So joining us today to speak to you are three health system leaders who are very versed in this topic, and I'll introduce them in the order in which you will hear from them. They're Sharon Tebert Maddox, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, Martha Nathanson, Vice President at LifeBridge, and her title is a government or contains government relations and community development, and Ryan O'Doherty, who is a Senior Vice President at Mercy for External Affairs. And I'm really pleased to be here with them today. We work very often together, as you will hear. Um, and again, they know these issues very, very well. So we're here to talk to you today about the triennial, once every three-year requirement, that is a requisite to us from the Affordable Care Act. And that's the CHNA, as we refer to it. This, we'll talk much about the 2021 CHNA process and the results from that. And you should know that this is the third iteration that we have had or time that we've had to do these in Baltimore City. It's the second time that the city hospitals have worked together in tandem uh, throughout this process to move it forward. Um, let me just say a couple of things. The CHNA is a tool both a tool and a process that has gained greater clarity, definition, and design in the way that we've conducted them over these last nine years or so that we've been doing this. It's gained greater utility, usefulness to our hospitals and our hospital leaders for planning. People understand the import and the uh, robustness of the information that may come from them. We have together been able to streamline the number of times that we inquire or reach out to our community partners to work with us on, on all of this. And our rate regulator, you may not know that we have that, but we have a rate regulator here in Maryland and a very unique system. Uh, they have come to understand very much the import of the material and the depth of the material that can be gathered. Many of us participated in almost a year long uh, commission or work group with, if you will, with the HSCRC, our rate regulator, looking at this and related issues. And most importantly, it really does provide a very in-depth analysis of our communities and the challenges that they face, the concerns that they may have, and their needs, whether they be somatic or physical uh, health concerns and conditions or environmental factors that are driving outcomes that uh, we need to be aware of. So what I'd like to do is have each of our presenters speak to you. Um, and Sharon is going to start off with a bit of a, a little bit more explanation about what this item is, the CHNA, followed by Martha. And then Ryan will uh, pick up last, but not least. And then ask, have you ask the questions that you may have. I think we would... Um, be best if we wait till the end for the questions in that there may be questions you have related to one or more presentations or the questions may just be more universal. So let's, um, let's go, Sharon. Thank you, Donna. As Donna said, I'm Sharon Tebert Maddox. I'm the Director of Community Health Improvement at Johns Hopkins. I do wanna give you a bit of an overview um, on what a CHNA is, what the purpose is, what the process looks like, and then share some of the Hopkins specific information from 2021. So let me share my screen here. All righty. Can everyone see that? Uh, does that look good? Yes. All right. So first, what is a CHNA? A community health needs assessment is an IRS mandated report. It was enacted as part of the Affordable Care Act and it is due once every three years. Now, the main purpose of it is to show that all nonprofit hospitals nationwide partner with their local communities to identify and address the community's highest priorities. In Maryland, this is nothing new. We've been doing it many years before the ACA was enacted, before it was even thought of. 
Um, but the standardization of language from the IRS has enabled us to have more collaboration opportunities, such as the Baltimore City Hospitals. All of them came together in 2018 to work on their CHNAs. And you can see why on the left side, the map shows the overlap between the hospitals of their community areas. So by working together, not only could we reach more people more effectively, but we reduced community survey fatigue, which is really a thing where too many people come by asking too many times what people need and what their needs are. We also could establish a common language between the hospitals on how we talk about community needs. So the CHNA is a year long process. It's a major, major work for hospitals to do. It involves secondary data analysis, of course, which you're all very familiar with. Uh, we look at various, I think over 35 this year for public health um, data sources. And then we do a lot of primary information collecting through interviews, survey, focus groups, um, to reach as many people in Baltimore as we can. That's followed by an implementation strategy development. How are we going to address the needs that have been identified? We publish the report and then it is um, approved by our boards of trustees. So who contributed? So in 2021, we worried that the COVID environment would keep us from getting as many participants as we have had in the past. In the past, we relied very heavily on in-person hand-delivered surveys at community meetings, community health fairs, et cetera. And in 2021, we actually exceeded our numbers. Over 6,000 Baltimore City residents participated. And that was done through the great help of over 100 community organizations. We reached out and made over 60,000 connections through email listservs, through newsletters, through a social media campaign, and in person at the COVID testing sites, blood drives, and clinics. This is a, hopefully, it's, smashed and hard to read, but this will be in your slides. This is a list of 105 of those community orgs. So for Johns Hopkins, who participated when we think about demographics, again, our numbers are better in 2021. Our demographics are better than they were in 2018. Our 2018 information skewed a bit towards females over 50. But in 2021, 43% of our responders were male versus 32% in 2021. Also 57% um, were under the age of 50. So some community comments I've put up. I thought this first one was really important and summed it up. You know, a lot of people in Baltimore can't afford to live, meaning they wake up every day and say, what do I need today to survive? Others have fallen off the knife's edge and are not going to get up. Another thing I thought was interesting is they talked a lot about mental health, as you'll see, it's a top priority, but the killers start with things we ignore, mental health, eating well, et cetera. And mental illness is seen as a weakness, which leads to isolation and feelings of abandonment. Another sort of common theme is the one about coming to the community where they are, helping bridge between the hospitals. You know, I thought it was very insightful that young adults don't know how to come to a doctor's appointment. What do they ask? What do they say? So how would they know? Up until they are a certain age, their parents would go with them. So that kind of increased communication and breaking down uh, barriers is particularly important. Also in our stakeholder interviews, we saw common themes around housing, um, the lack of affordable quality housing, and the um, job opportunities. Job opportunities has always been a very, very high ranking need in our community. So we put it all together. We took it to the community. We said out of the 1,700 in East Baltimore in the Hopkins area, these are the highest priorities that have been identified. Do you agree to the community panel? And what came up is 
two different ways to think about it, socioeconomic needs and direct health needs. So in socioeconomic needs, the top need in 2021 is housing and homelessness. This is a first time for us. Uh, two reports ago, housing was fifth. In 2018, housing was third, and now for the first time, 2021, housing is first, um, followed by job opportunities, which previously was always the highest need. We thought this might have been COVID influenced, even though the survey very carefully asks about thinking more long-term over the next three years, when hopefully we're not as uh, concerned with COVID. Um, but in fact, by asking a separate COVID question, we know that housing is not a top concern in a COVID environment. Uh, so housing, job opportunities, safety, access to care and food environment and direct health needs remain the, excuse me, remain the same. It's always behavioral health, it's always substance use and mental health at the top. Here's our COVID question. 43% of respondents uh, did not have uh, a need for assistance in this time of COVID, and 31% of respondents needed food. And that was the highest and quickest response that uh, we did as a hospital is immediately set up food delivery. So after we've determined the priorities, the next step is to develop an implementation strategy. How will we address these identified priorities? Each one of our 10 needs that we've identified is accompanied by this table, a table like this in our report. And so the common goal for all the strategies, a strategy, the metrics, how are we gonna measure success and listing potential partners. So in the job opportunity example I have here, it's very easy to see strategy one is about workforce development, workforce training, making connections. Strategy two is about actual jobs, actual hires, actual opportunities that are filled. And strategy three is about spend, how much we spend with vendors that are local and minority. Some examples of our employment programs, the summer jobs program, hiring Baltimore City uh, high school residents, we doubled our uh, support of that in the past couple of years. P-TECH is an interesting program that is a six-year program for high school students, takes them through a college degree and into a bona fide job. Um, Turnaround Tuesdays, uh, an opportunity largely for returning citizens to join the workforce. And here's Hopkins Local at the, at the bottom again, our big, big program about hire, buy, and spend. So hire, hire, and housing and spend. So construction opportunities are spend with minority and local businesses and our job opportunities. And so with that, I will turn it over to Martha and LifeBridge. I'm on mute, it's only been a year and a half. Thank you. Okay, uh, again, I'm Martha Nathanson, Vice President Government Relations and Community Development for LifeBridge Health. And Sharon's done a great job, Sharon and Donna have done a great job of laying out the universe of the CHNA. I'm going to dive right into what we found at LifeBridge and how we, uh, examples of how we propose to address these needs that were identified. Next slide, please. Um, so Sinai, LifeBridge is com comprised of uh, Sinai Hospital and Levendale in Baltimore City, Northwest Hospital in Randallstown, Carroll Hospital in Carroll County and also our newest hospital, which is the former Bon Secours on the west side of Baltimore in Baltimore City. Um, so all of those, each of those individual hospitals did a CHNA, all part of this process that's been laid out um, before you with the hospitals collaborating with each other because of our, our overlapping service areas. People in Baltimore City go to any hospital they want to. That's part of our, our um, regulated system is you don't have to go to the hospital that's just in your neighborhood. and and so we do get people from across the city, so that's why we collaborated. So many of our needs are gonna be the same, but still Baltimore's Baltimore and small to more, small to more, and area, East Baltimore is different than West Baltimore. West Baltimore is different than Northwest Baltimore where 
two areas where we operate. So you'll see some differences. But we did do Sinai and Levendale together because they're both located on the Belvedere Avenue corridor. And what we found as the primary concerns in that area in, the 20, in 20, our 2021 assessment were the blue boxes at, 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 at the top. Um, obviously, substance abuse, the opioid epi epidemic continued through COVID and was top of mind for a lot of people. You see mental health and depression, again, that is universal and never seems to um, to move from the top concerns that you'll that we that we see. We also saw community health education and community engagement. And what's meant by that, Sharon mentioned that as well, the need to go out into our community to provide um, opportunities for healthcare access, to get our physicians out into the community and to minimize the time when people have to come into the hospital for primary care and routine types of care. Obviously for specialty care, um, it's important to come to the hospital and certainly for things like surgery. So we're really committed to uh, finding ways to move outward into the community. We also heard in the green, that was, those were the next level of, of, of interest. And a lot of that is those social, social determinants of health, jobs, access to insurance, housing and homeless, access to physicians, access to healthy foods was a, a big one that came up even in our, our, um, our other service areas in the county and, and in Carroll County, um, very important. Community safety, um, in our 2018 Sinai and Levendale uh, CHNAs, community safety and violence was literally the top, like the top left hand corner of what we saw um, that, that's where that, that would have been and you'll see that we established a lot of programs to that that was still um, very high on the list for people to to, to identify as, as a need again these are um, social determinants of health that are outside the direct health care services that we provide but also important important part of our public health approach to providing health care next slide please um can't see it is that grace I don't see the title. Is that Grace Medical Center? I think ah, so. interesting. Uh, yeah, the title's a little bit off. I, th um, I think it's Grace. So I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, it looks familiar to me. Yes, the transportation especially. So Grace Medical Center, again, um, former Bon Secours Hospital located in West Baltimore. Um, behavioral health, substance abuse, opioid, again, top of, top of the, top of mind. You'll see there crime and related trauma was top of mind. And, um, in, in the next slide, I'll talk about how we've expanded some of our existing violence intervention programs to that area as well. Health education, transportation, a key issue in almost all of our areas, um, but really rose to the top, um, in, in, at Grace Medical Center. Again, jobs right there, access to healthy food, housing and homelessness, common themes that we see, youth support, youth services, uh, more community engagement, meaning getting things out into the community. And one of the hallmarks of our acquisition of Grace Medical Center of Bon Secours was um, a, a establishing primary care, OBGYN, endocrine, all kinds of clinic space and clinic opportunities that were heretofore not available in that community. So getting those things out into the community, making them accessible. And interestingly, financial counseling and literacy came up. So we're, we're looking at ways to expand some of our HR programs around that issue and make them available to uh, people in the communities. Um, the next slide, please. So this is Northwest Hospital in Randallstown. We, the folks at uh, Benia asked us to just address because there's a slight regional approach. Um, we just wanted to tell you what we're doing in very nearby Randallstown, just over the city line. Again, many of the same patients. Um, those were more oriented towards actual healthcare conditions and a little bit less focused in the in the top. Um, responses in the social determinants. So chronic heart disease, um, diabetes, uh, uh, mental health and depression clearly there. Health disparities came up there as well. Um, Northwest ha ha tends to have a very high Medicare population, a lot of older population. So less on the you know employment side of things and more on the chronic illnesses from which they suffer. Food insecurity, again, a big issue and transportation um, across all of, and community safety across all of our institutions. Institutions. Um, next slide, please. So um, how do we respond? These are just examples. If I if I showed you the, the page like, like Sharon did, it, it would be so teeny you couldn't see it. There's pages and pages of the programs that we've uh, um, 
established to respond to these needs. But I wanted to bring up um, some key examples, and that's in the areas of community safety, health disparities, and chronic heart disease. So um, as I mentioned, we created what's called the LifeBridge Center for Hope, which is having a building built now on, on the property next to the Pimlico Racecourse that we own. And we took all of our disparate violence related programs that we already had, like um, violence response in the ER, the Dove program, which is domestic violence, um, the Kuji Center, which is workforce development, Baltimore Child Abuse became, Center became part of LifeBridge. And we put these all together in a virtual center called the Center for Hope, um, where these programs continue to operate independently and to respond to needs independently, but they benefit from best practices for being together in a, in a center and also being co-housed in this new program that we're going to be um, uh, uh, building it, it on Belvedere Avenue. So um, again, this was a continuation from the work that we did in 2018 after that community health needs assessment. And the example that I gave you at Grace Medical is Baltimore Child Abuse Center will be having space in or, and around Grace Medical, we also have a resource center there. So they will be they will be um, having satellite space there. Well, they will provide some of the child abuse prevention and intervention programs, and all of the um, the the programs that you see here will also have um, outposts in at Grace Medical and extensions of the Sinai Hospital programming. So that's an opportunity to build on what we've already done. Health disparities. Um, we recently partnered with Baltimore, are, are partnering with West Baltimore barbershops and salons to do health risk screening, education, COVID-19 vaccinations, most importantly at this point, access to healthcare providers and health insurance and links to social services. So again, that um, health community, what was referred to as community engagement, meaning going out into the community to actually provide our services. And um, we uh, also provided a mobile clinic to reach underserved communities and vi provide vaccinations and health screenings and link to primary and specialty care. What we learned is during COVID, not only were people maybe not getting COVID vaccinations, but they did not get their their kids into their um, normal pediatric appointments, partly because we had to be closed under the emergency, but also even afterwards because they were concerned about going into the hospital setting and so went to their doctor's offices. So many were behind on their vaccinations by up to a year or more. And so we sent that mobile clinic out to reach people there to get them to, to get their vaccinations and adults as well who need it, who might need some sort of booster shots. Um, and finally, and then we expanded our home remote monitoring, monitoring um, for blood pressure and weight and congestive heart failure and things like that. And finally, our, our chronic heart disease programming, um, that was actually established in our first CHNA, which is 2015, a congestive heart failure program, which is really keeping people out of the hospital and um, amazing stories of people having um, remote monitoring and, and, um, and and, and having problems with their weight on any particular day and calling their physicians and having now to having telehealth visits about that and um, sending um, in some cases emergency services out to get folks if they're immediately at risk for some congestive heart failure related um, comorbidities. So um, the, 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 we've, we've kept in contact with people and that, that's really a perfect example of managing a chronic condition um, based upon doing this outside of the hospital, in community settings, in the home, and in response to the identified need um, at, at, at a community level. So, um, and those are the, the examples that I wanted to share with you today. Okay. Sharon, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Martha and Sharon. All right, next up we have Brian O'Darity, and I think Ryan's going to post his own slides. Sure, just one moment. Uh, while I'm uh, trying to do that, um, I'm having a little difficulty here. Ah. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Okay. Look for the button. Um, well, first of all, I, I just want to make a few comments uh, before I kick off here. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to thank Donna uh, and University of Maryland. You know, one of the things I'd like to share with folks is that uh, Mercy, you know, we're a teaching hospital. We actually have an academic affiliation with the University of Maryland. 
uh, for the past hundred years, actually. So, so we've been working closely with Marilyn. And thank you to uh, Martha and, and from LifeBridge and Sharon from Hopkins. And I also want to thank uh, SEMA uh, for organizing this event and actually uh, for the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance for helping Mercy develop our community health needs assessment. Um, you know, one of the key components of the community health needs assessment that 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 is a requirement uh, through um, the IRS guidelines is, is you have to define your community. And this gets, this gets really interesting uh, depending on what, what kind of hospital you are. Mercy is a tertiary referral center. Um, we serve a very large ge geographic region, um, not just our immediate downtown area. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see is, it's a zip code map of our uh, primary and secondary service areas for Mercy. And that represents about 75% of hospital discharges. Um, and it's just worth noting that Mercy, you know, there's many hospitals in Baltimore City. There's obviously more hospitals in Baltimore County and Mercy's not the dominant hospital provider in any of these zip codes uh, because we are this sort of tertiary referral center. Um, so- And you, you might wanna flip us up to your next slide. To see your, I think we all see your title slide. Oh, thanks. Let me try this one on a second. Bear with me. Yeah. Okay, can you see it now? There it Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for catching that, Donna, because it looked right on my screen, but <laughs> appreciate it. So, so again, you know, on, on the, on the left there, you know, is our, you know, our sort of broader geographic service area. So we analyzed the data looking at it, you know, how do we define our community uh, as it relates to our community health needs assessment and what we're doing in our immediate community downtown, again, recognizing that you know, we're sandwiched between two very large academic medical centers, University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins, and really understanding our role within those communities uh, as a smaller independent hospital. So, uh, so what we did uh, as part of our CHNA, using the data provided uh, th through um, uh, SEMA and our team, is we've looked at. Um, and I should also say we we don't use zip codes. We actually look at individual neighborhoods. This is a little bit different approach in terms of how we define our com communities. So we looked at um, uh, emergency room visits. We looked at low birth weight babies. We looked at where people uh, people individuals who who required financial assistance. We sort of plotted all of that on a, onto a map, and that helped us develop our community health needs assessment service area. So that's when we're looking at the data, we're looking at that, that uh, box sort of in the center there of the map uh, of the neighborhoods. Another thing we include in the uh, community health needs assessment, this is not a requirement of the, uh, the IRS, but I think it's, it's really important because I'm always thinking about, you know, what about people who are not from Baltimore who are reading these documents, you know, policy wonks from other uh, states or, or even regulators and uh, really think it's important to sort of lay out the, the multitude of challenges that Baltimore uh, ha has faced over the last several decades. And so we, we provide quite a bit of data uh, as it relates to these key issues, including uh, poverty, crime, uh, drug addiction, uh, you know, population that has health insurance and, and uh, median household income. Um, these beautiful maps were, were uh, created by SEMA and her team, um, and, and we utilize these in our uh, community health needs assessment. Um, we are looking here at the map on the left is, is percentage of households in poverty. And uh, as you can see, a good number of the neighborhoods with the largest amount of poverty are within our defined community health uh, needs assessment area. Um, and also you can see here on the other side of the page, um, 
life expectancy. And you see that there's the correlation there of, you know, income, wealth, poverty, and life expectancy. And as you all probably know, you've probably read in the paper or seen on television many times, you know, just the significant disparities in life expectancy neighborhood to neighborhood in Baltimore City. Um, obviously, we, we also look at, you know, one of the uh, key issues that affects the health, and, and Martha talked about this in her presentation with what LifeBridge is doing to address community violence. You know, the violent crime rate, homicides, shootings uh, affects life expectancy in our neighborhoods. Uh, so understanding um, that data and incorporating that into our report is important. And we also look at teen birth rate and other uh, birth outcome data. Um, uh, Mercy happens to be the largest uh, hospital for births in Baltimore City. About one in five city babies are, are born at Mercy. It's a service line that we're very committed to. Um, so we, we look uh, especially at birth outcomes as well in, in Baltimore and where the issues are. So, um, you know, for us, our, our key findings uh, really revolve around, you know, what, what does our area look like versus the city as a whole? Obviously, we outline that the city has significant challenges, but what about the neighborhood specifically in our uh, community health needs assessment service area? And you see here that, uh, you know, poverty rate is higher in our community health needs area. Um, the the uh, Life expectancy is is lower, um, and, and unfortunately, it's declining. It's moving in the wrong direction uh, since our last uh, report. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, life expectancy is is impacted by deaths among young people, uh, which can include uh, homicides. So um, we include that data in the report, and we evaluate it and look at it uh, for our service area. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, drug and alcohol related deaths and, 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 and strokes are the, are the top causes of death. Um, I will say that for this data, we use Baltimore City Health Department and we're, all of us have partnered with the health department. We work directly with them uh, on, on data gathering, uh, especially I would say in the last CHNA cycle, um, we, we worked, all of us worked very closely with the health department uh, in, in terms of data gathering as part of that collaborative process with all the city hospitals working together to, to gather data. Um, and so that's where that information comes from. Um, and, and then another area, you know, looking at is uh, prenatal care. And again, we talked about birth outcomes um, and uh, we, we, do, we have seen some improvement there. Um, there is an initiative some of you may have heard of called Be More for Healthy Babies, uh, which is a very large collaborative uh, group of uh, community organizations, uh, providers, government agencies, and so forth uh, that have been working together on Be More for Healthy Babies. And, and we have seen some improvement uh, in those areas um, uh, in terms of mothers receiving prenatal care. I will say that, you know, here we are at 65%, you know, the national number is 77. So we've got quite a ways to go to improve uh, prenatal care for, for mothers in Baltimore City. And again, uh, as, as Mercy has a significant number of the city's births, this is an issue which we are especially focused on uh, here at the hospital. Um, and, and another area that we're looking at is you know, you know, we can look at it by zip code, we can look at it citywide, but another way of looking at it is individual neighborhoods. And here you really see the disparity uh, between uh, mothers getting prenatal care uh, in, in neighborhoods and, and, and not getting it. And, you know, it's, it's frankly uh, unfortunate, but not shocking that the, the, the neighborhoods with the highest percentage of mothers getting prenatal care are majority white neighborhoods. And the, and the neighborhoods that, with, that have the lowest number are majority black. We are seeing improvement in here. And the good news is we're seeing improvement uh, that is equitable uh, in terms of the numbers uh, moving in the right direction. Um, so this, this will be uh, a continued focus for Mercy uh, for, for many years to come. Again, working with our community partners, working with the health department and, and our hospital colleagues as well. Um, 
you know, Sharon talked about the survey that was done. Uh, these are just some highlights. Again, we did a subset of that data that represented the communities that that were in our in our area, uh, and these were the top issues that were identified um, uh, coming out of that um, in terms of most important health issues affecting the community. And you see them there listed. I won't go through all of them, but alcohol and drug addiction, mental health, uh, smoking, and diabetes are are among the top issues there. Uh, and um, similarly. Uh, different question, you know, what are the most important social environmental problems that you think affect the health of your community? So here, you know, what I, what I think is great about this is that we're really asking the community what they think is going on in their community. We're not dictating to anybody, you know, uh, what we're seeing based on the data. We're soliciting the feedback directly from community members who actually live there. And we know where they live because they provided their uh, zip code information and that helped us aggregate it. But here you go again, uh, very similar to what Sharon was saying earlier about how housing and homelessness has really uh, increased as a major uh, social concern, job opportunities, and then safety and violence and poverty. Uh, all of those I'd say for us have been, uh, have been fairly consistent. And again, our service area uh, downtown, um, uh, there is a larger home, homeless population uh, in the downtown area. So I do think we picked that up here in, the, in, in our survey. Um, in addition to that, um, working with, uh, um, we, we have, uh, you know, conducted stakeholder interviews um, working with the University of Baltimore in a, in a controlled fashion and soliciting additional sort of, you know, qualitative feedback about what some of the issues are in, in our communities. And this is just a brief summary of, of some of the things and key themes that have come out of those discussions. Uh, and so, you know, what do we do with all this, I think, is the key question. Uh, again, we are we are mandated by the federal government through the Affordable Care Act via the IRS to do these reports, but we want to maximize the opportunity and get actionable information out of it. I think all of the hospitals on the on the call today agree that, you know, let's let's make the most out of this opportunity to really drive change and try to improve. Uh, progress. So, so what that leads to for Mercy, and each hospital has its own uh, set of priorities, and there's some where we're working together on issues. Um, but each of us sort of walk through and and define, you know, what are we going to focus on? What are what are our focus areas? So for Mercy, um, we are a longstanding partner with Healthcare for the Homeless. We're a founding partner of of creating it. Uh, which is a federally qualified health center specifically for individuals experiencing homelessness. So we're going to continue uh, to improve access to care for homeless uh, individuals. Um, we are very focused on uh, providing support uh, for victims of violence and addiction. You know, Mercy has one of the, um, has a safe program that uh, handles all sexual assault cases in Baltimore City. So that's just one example of one of the programs that ties to community violence and, and supporting victims. We also have one of two inpatient detox programs in the city uh, addressing addiction. Uh, I talked already about improving birth outcomes and prenatal care. That will continue to be a big focus. Again, working with our partners with Be More for Healthy Babies and, and, and our federally, federally qualified health centers like Total Healthcare, uh, who we work closely with. Uh, another big issue that has emerged is, is really this idea of expanding access to, to manage chronic disease. And this fits around sort of the whole idea of population health, you know, improving uh, the ability of folks to get primary care in the community so that they're not showing up at the emergency room in the hospital uh, for, for primary care. And we're addressing things on the front end rather than on the back end. And that ties back to the whole Maryland reimbursement system and our, and our, Mer our unique Maryland model that all of us, all the hospitals are, are working on together moving forward. And then lastly, um, you know, we'll, we continue to provide health education to the community. And again, as I mentioned before, we're a teaching hospital and, and our partnership with University of Maryland, we're committed to providing education for future physicians. 
Uh, some of those physicians are educated and they go to other states, unfortunately, but some of them stay. So it is a critically important um, uh, piece of, of what we provide to the community is educating future physicians and, and all that goes into that. So um, this last slide is just some, some stakeholder comments. I won't go through any of those, but, but um, you know, again, uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but these are kind of the main issues that we'll be focused on moving forward. Thank you, all three of you. You really put some context here for our listeners. Let me just maybe give a little bit more of a bucket for our listeners to understand. Sharon did speak about this process taking the better part of a year to complete. And there are some items or elements of it that are absolutely requisite. The first half is all about the research. What, what does the what do the data show us and from whom do you get that? And we've spoken a lot about community input, community feedback, but as well, we have to talk about, talk to the experts uh, in our communities who do healthcare on a regular basis. So be that the health department or by example, the uh, Diabetes Association, Heart Association, whomever. So when we speak about going out to community, we're inclusive of that. As well, we have to gather the data what do the primary sources and the secondary source data, data say to us? And maybe you guys, there were a few references to it. If you can just click off very quickly, a couple of other primary and secondary sources that you look to when you're gathering data. Who wants to jump in? It's always hard when you're on Zoom. Sharon, where else did you guys look? Or what up, Brian? Oh, you're on mute, Ryan. One of the great things about working with um, University of Baltimore and the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance is, you know, and this is data week, that's the, that's the point of our conversation today, um, is just the multitude of, of data that they have at their finger, finger and, and it includes many, many different sources. Uh, you know, it could be the census data, it could be American Community Survey, it could be data that the uh, uh, Baltimore City Health Department compiles and collects. Um, so, so sort of, you know, having access to that, sort of trying to make sense of it, breaking it down by neighborhood and, and looking at some of these key indicators um, is, is really useful. BNIA might wanna jump in here since I know they did some of the work for you guys as well. Someone wants to speak to that? Not Sharon, Seema? We just, we put some of the responses in the uh, chat. So we're happy to answer specific ones based on the Mercy one. But, you know, obviously the other hospitals would love to hear from you as well. Sharon. So I was just gonna add in the, in the secondary data sources that it was really interesting to us to go, um, you know, pretty far wide on the crime and safety to look at not only the Baltimore stats so distinctly by neighborhood that was available, but also FBI data, for example. There's just a lot of uh, a lot of sources out there. But I did want to mention on this subject the challenge that we have when looking at these secondary data sources is trying to figure out how to interpret the data in a in a standardized way and you know the dates are the dates are different from the last data that's been collected if you're trying to look at trends if you're trying to look at how you've changed or moved the needle you know or made a, a change in, in uh, health indicators really trying to line up those information sources make that very very difficult there are things that we uh, saw we haven't been updated since 2013 that we wanted to use and then didn't. Um, so just putting that into the mix. There's a question in the chat, a couple, several questions in the chat. I hope we get to all of them, but one is about how are hospitals held accountable to the findings or recommendations? And of course, there were references here to the implementation plans, which each hospital must do following the data analyses that we've spoken about. Um, Ryan made a reference very quickly to the IRS and certainly there's board accountability. So if any of you would like to comment further on that, we'd love to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, there has been IRS enforcement of hospitals. We haven't seen it here locally as far as I understand it, but. 
um, nationally, there, there has been a focus on, you know, making sure that hospitals, again, the accountability is, have you conducted your CHNA in the way that the Congress has, you know, prescribed that you do so, and, and whether or not you're meeting those IRS guidelines. So, uh, so there's definitely accountability uh, from, from that level. And as Donna mentioned, you know, our own boards of trustees who are largely made up of Baltimore community members, Baltimore business leaders. And then of course here at Mercy, we have uh, religious sisters of mercy on our board as well. Um, but they're very interested in these topics. And um, I just had the opportunity of presenting this to, to our board. And so mm -hmm. we get uh, detailed questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that um, in terms of the board involvement. At LifeBridge, we have a board level community mission committee made up of members of our board who serve on that particular committee. And uh, as part of the, 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 the engagement process, really, I think is what the IRS is focusing on, is what the requirements focus on, is to not assume that we're doing these assessments with a certain level of community engagement, but actually providing guidance for how to do that. And, and that's really what they're focusing on with the understanding that if we do that, if we do active community engagement, which we clearly did with the numbers that we saw, then we're really going to be able to be as responsive as we can. So um, our, our board really focused on the outreach process and the getting the, 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 not so much the secondary data collection, they didn't really get involved in that level, but they wanted to make sure and really held us accountable for talking about how many people we interviewed, how we interviewed them, what we did with the information that, that they gave us and how we came about prioritizing which programs we, we would be able to actually do in response to that data we collected. And they were so interested in that and concerned about that, that they participated in the prioritization process. So the, these community mission committee members were actually part of our community prioritization process where we said, we heard 50 ideas from you. Now you got to take these and and decide which of the, which 10 can we do? We can't do all 50. Uh, Transportation is a perfect example. Hospitals cannot unilaterally resolve the transportation issues that we have. So that became a lower priority based upon input from our communities as well as our board members. So they are actively involved. And, and once they're involved like that, they're gonna be holding us accountable for doing what they said was a priority. So that's one way that we were, are able to ensure that we remain accountable. I would actually second the, all of what you just said, Martha, very much. Um, I'm a part of a system with 13 hospitals and more and more our hospitals have engaged community engagement committees or advisory boards from the community and they mean to hold us accountable just in the ways that you have said. As well, Ryan, there have been uh, random audits and of some hospitals in Baltimore from the IRS and they are looking to see that the elements that the law requires are included and you will get a questionnaire and a knock on your door if that is not happening. So, so that is going on. There's an early question here as well and Ryan made some references to this We've spoken about the th three iterations, so the nine years that we've been doing these. Have there been improvements in the health indicators or reduction in racial health disparities since we've started this? And let me just start um, with a general comment that when the, for us, for the medical system, when we did the first one some years ago, the comments were all about chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. The second iteration and since, we're really seeing a movement more upstream about the things that are underlying causes for what we see manifest as real somatic physical health conditions. But other comments, Th these are intractable issues. Let me just say that these are very challenging issues, but your comments, please. Well, I'd like to pop in on this and, you know, and you talk about accountability and, and Martha mentioned the issue of just transportation, okay? Uh, it, you know, it's a very complex issue. Um, ob obviously, it ties into poverty, access to jobs. Um, but when we look at accountability, you know, it's important that we look at the whole picture. Uh, so, for example, many of our hospitals uh, provide uh, transportation vouchers to patients so that they can, you know, you know we pay for that, um, you know, at a loss to, to make sure that patients can get to the appointments that they need to get to for the purpose of 
uh, improving their health and improving outcomes uh, for the community. But we're not the only ones in the transportation game. Uh, you know, we provide a voucher for MTA, but if MTA cuts the bus line, just to use an example, I'm not trying to be controversial, but just to use an example, um, you know, that has an impact. So, you know, if, if we're going to look at accountability for health, health outcomes, and we all understand that health outcomes are derived from uh, many things, including poverty, access to jobs, crime, things like that. We have to look at all the players that, that are part of that and, and how we're holding everyone accountable uh, for those issues. Um, you know, hospitals are healthcare providers and we do, I think we do a really good job of providing healthcare and we're trying to move upstream and trying to do more around prevention so that people don't have to go to the hospital. But many of these issues you know, it's, it's so much larger than just healthcare. It's, it's basically our, the fabric of our society and what we as a society decide we want to invest in, uh, whether it's education for kids or, um, you know, economic development and so on and so forth. There's a question in the chat. Uh, there were a number of areas listed and one, the last one was other. The question was, what's in other? And Sharon, you answered in the chat, but if you would answer here, that'd be great so everybody can have the benefit of the response. Yeah, so interestingly enough, for Hopkins, the other was um, alcohol and drug addiction, but it showed up in the um, social determinants. I could pull that up again. I just had that. Um, yeah, for the social needs, mostly included direct health needs reference, right? So we'd have drug and alcohol under direct health, and it was behavioral health, number one and number two, but it showed up in other under social determinants of health. And then uh, the other way around for direct health needs, other included a lot of crime and safety um, remarks. Great. Great. There are, there's also questions um, about whether or not we reached out to a specific organization. And I'm not gonna call them out because we could do that for forever. But if you guys would like to just comment on how we go about the process of reaching community, I think that would be instructive. I can help one. So in go this ahead. process, one of our really great partners, because we, in our focus groups, we always go in East Baltimore, we wanna make sure that we have um, input from expenders, from homeless, and from active users or people in recovery. And so Dee's Place has been one that we go to. I don't know if you know Dee's Place, but they have some wonderful programming. And it's been very helpful to us to have focus groups there. We, we partner with them and we've been able to do that three times in two, you know, the last three assessments. So that's been very, very helpful. You know, there's so many community partners, but that would be one where we'd say, okay, who is working in our area on this need or knows this population or whose expertise can we say, can you help us? Can we reach this, this group? And these is one. Let me also, I'm sorry, Martha, let me say one thing. Let me also say to everyone that Again, these community health needs assessments, as well as the implementation plans are posted on our website and they reside there minimally for three years. Commentaries from any part of our community are welcome at any time and it helps us hone what we do and make it more crisp so everyone can participate in that way. Martha? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna give an example of a partner um, that's been really productive for us is working with a local church. Um, the churches have uh, committees of volunteers who focus on many things um, and they have a health, the one that we work with has a health committee or a wellness committee. And, and, and these are folks that are really passionate about it. You know, they get out and they exercise and they research and they're very interested in wellness generally. And so we've been able to get feedback from them um, that's, been, that's been super helpful. So I, I encourage people to, to collaborate in that way with, um, you know, these are folks who are volunteers, they're, they're retired, they're older, that's a lot of what our population is. So that's just one small example that's been a very productive partnership. We also work with, I saw the certain foundations, we work with all of those health oriented, like the American, I think Donna said, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, um, things like that for um, the specific needs that we, that have been identified. 
by our populations. Let, let me make an observation on behalf of our listeners, if you will, be devil's advocate for here for a minute. You guys are so facile in describing this process. It sounds like it's something that's pretty easy, although Sharon says it takes almost a year. What are the challenges to doing this? Are I'll start that. Yeah. I, I think the challenge is trying to get the, the broad enough representation of the community, right? You want to make sure that you're not just getting whatever. There's a perception that we use internal experts. Oh, it's Hopkins and they're telling. To Ryan's point, you have to ask, not tell. Um, so we have to make sure that that's a challenge and that's part of the, the length of the process. Um, but also when you look at the, when you look at the total in your community service area, we have 300,000 people in our community service area. So to the accountability point before, you know, how are we gonna be held accountable? So Don, what Donna said is that the reports are public and that's one way you can go and you can see, but another is in fact, getting that representation and that broad input so that it's, that it's there and you can check and you can say, okay, 300,000 people, I went out on the street and I said, hey, did you know Hopkins was doing this community health needs assessment? You know, right. And the person will likely say no when you look at 6,000 or for us 1,700 out of, of 300,000. So that's that's a challenge. But that accountability is is built into this process. The IRS made absolute sure that that would happen because that's the purpose to hold hospitals accountable, to show and to demonstrate that they partner with their communities. I, honestly, for, for us, what the challenge was in that prioritization process. So we got really great data from a lot of people, even during COVID. So much information came in. There is not a one of those identified needs that any of us can say is not bona fide. It's not really a need. It's just a one-off because there were themes that went through everything. So it's really a challenge to prioritize them and then to say these we have limited dollars these are the these are the ones that we should put those dollars to it's 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 torture for us to make those decisions some are easy transportation is easy we can't solve the transportation issue we can do vouchers we can do that um, violence is another one of those systemic problems that we know we can't solve but that is so strongly a part of the 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 issues that come into our facilities in terms of trauma in the ER and our trauma centers, and in, even in other areas of our hospitals where, where trauma of all kinds. So that was not an easy decision, but we had to make it even though there are so many factors that are beyond our ability to influence. Um, so, so trying to balance out all those, what can we impact? What can we not impact? Should we do that anyway? It, it, it's a very difficult and challenging process. Let me just say one last thing, and we're almost here at time. First of all, I certainly appreciate all of our speakers today, but um, Martha speaks to the size and the magnitude of some of these problems in Baltimore City. And I mentioned at the very outset that we work together often. Once we have individually done our work, set our priorities and done our implementation plans, we actually sit down to see and compare what we've determined are, are high priorities and how we might work together so that we can force multiply, which is very advantageous. And I think it's great for the, for the city as well. So I see Seema has come back on and um, I just want to once again say thank you and thank you all for listening. This has been a great session. I really do appreciate you all very much. Seema, did you have 